an example like that, you're asked to calculate the median of this row of numbers. Uh, what you can do is, uh, and I have this here on video for you guys. There is under data, there's something, something that is called text to columns. If you click on text to columns with a cell that contains a row of data with comma separated by commas, and you click here on next, and you tell it it's separated by commas, you can separate it out. It will recognize that the uh, separator is commas, and then it will basically give it to you in that format. Yeah. And the only thing you need to do then, if you're being asked, for example, okay, give me a median of these numbers, you're the median, text to columns. Uh, Put it up by row. Text to, I've never used it in that. Uh, well, one thing which you can do, you basically are selecting this and you go and copy and you're copying this and you go here on transpose. Remember that? Transpose will basically put it now down, downwards. Uh, not here. So transpose will put it downwards. Oh, cool. That's quite useful. So that's, that's a yeah. workaround. Text to rows, that's a very interesting question. I don't think that exists. I do not think that exists. Sorry for that, that's a limitation. That's an interesting suggestion, actually. Surprised it doesn't exist. Okay, good question. Um, all right, confidence intervals. But let's go back first to um, hypothesis testing. Um, I'm sure you remember from last time that there were several steps in hypothesis testing. The most and foremost, you need to understand what populations you're dealing with. Nolan and Heinz listed as an explicit point in hypothesis testing, and they're talking about six steps of hypothesis testing. So utilize, please, the six questions from Nolan and Heinz. This only lists five. Uh, but basically, first, understand your distributions, understand your populations, understand what you're dealing with, understand which method you need to choose. Um, so this is step one, as per Norton and Heinzen. Then essentially go next to state the hypothesis, which basically uh, involves the development of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The example that we uh, discussed last time was essentially that we have a sample we have a randomly drawn sample. We know the population mean and we know the population standard deviation. And we want to compare our sample mean to the population mean. And we want to know whether our sample mean is significantly different from our population mean. So we're testing the null hypothesis that our sample mean and our population mean are identical. Whereas under the research hypothesis, these are not identical. Secondly, we're defining the significance level alpha. Alpha, in essence, is nothing else in hypothesis testing where you, where you collapse your data and your comparison between sample and population mean to a dichotomous insight. So you're saying it's either significantly different or the null hypothesis is true and they're not different. Then thirdly, you draw a sample size of n and you compute the test statistic. Um, you do a set test when the sigma of the population is known. Um, the T distribution is going to be more important uh, moving forward. Right now, not important. Were you estimating the sigma using the standard deviation from your sample? But that we will do in the following classes, not part of the midterm. Then based on that set, you basically determine a p-value. Remember, the p-value is to be read from the distribution table. What we utilized in population descriptives as uh, defining proportions within a population within certain boundaries, and we quantified 68% of the population is between one negative standard deviation and one positive standard deviation. We're utilizing now for hypothesis testing for the determination of probabilities. Reason for that is because now we're also dealing uh, not with individual data points anymore. And I just want to remind you of the central limit theorem, where basically we have a distribution of scores. That's our population. 
and then we're drawing a sample and we're getting one mean for that sample and we're comparing now the mean of the sample to the mean of the population and we're doing that assuming that that sample of the size n with the known standard deviation from the population will have a certain variability if it were one of a large random number of samples that were drawn. So all these means will have a certain distribution that is related to the standard deviation of the population and the size of the sample. So the, the larger the standard deviation in the population, the more likely you will see more variability in your mean estimates from your samples. The larger the sample, the more accurate your sample mean estimate will be compared to the population mean. So if you if you test 100,000 people and you're taking from these 100,000 people 90,000 into your samples, your estimate of the mean is going to be fairly good. And if you draw two samples of that size, two random samples of that size, you will have two means that are both pretty good and they will vary less. That's how you have to think about that. So less variability with large sample sizes, more variability with a lot of variability in the population because that's where you're drawing it from. Makes sense, right, conceptually. So, but what's important to keep in mind, uh, so we worked with the distribution of individual scores. These are individual patients or individual people with happiness score estimates with cholesterol, blood pressures, blood sugar levels, whatever. So these are individual in, individual entries, individual scores. When we get this to the level of a sample mean estimate, we're employing the central limit theorem, which means that there's a relationship between the distribution of the individual scores and this distribution of the sample mean estimates. And this is where we're actually having in our hands one mean estimate. But we're treating, is, we're treating it in the shape and form and we're using for standardization and estimate as if this one sample would have been one of a larger number of samples. So we're quantifying that variability that we would expect if we had a large number of samples of that size. That's why we're quantifying the standard error of the mean. And we're utilizing the standard error of the mean of calculating a set. And this set will, again, as per the distribution, they will get us to a percentage. But this percentage is now not what it was in population stats, where we say the proportion of patients or proportion of individuals. No, now it is probabilities. Probabilities of our sample mean being significantly different or not significantly different. So if we have a certain probability against which we're testing, that the null hypothesis is true or is to be rejected. And we're defining an alpha level of 5%. Our critical threshold will be a, will be a set score of minus 1.96. It's 2.5% on one side and it's 2.5% on the other side, which is plus 1.96 which is here 97.5%, which is 100 minus 97.5. So the difference is again, 2.5%. So they, these are our two 2.5% on both sides of the normal distribution curve. In essence, it's this, uh, where's it here? No. In essence, it's this, no, where's it? Oh, yeah, yeah. In essence, it's this distribution of the sample means. So let's assume this is the distribution of the sample means. We have our one mean here in the center, and around this, this is our standard error of the mean. Out here, we're essentially having our alphas. So if our population mean is outside of these boundaries and the critical value is exceeded, we're essentially rejecting the null hypothesis of the sample mean here being different than the population mean, which could be here. So the sample was drawn now from uh, a group in the population that is more extreme than the overall general bulk of the population. That's one way to look at this. 
So it's different, it's significantly different our sample from the population mean. The way this is illustrated, and we've talked about this example briefly, uh, is here the example of, um, yeah, is here the example where we uh, want to compare the cholesterol levels of a sample of hypertensive male smokers to the overall mean cholesterol of the US population, which is 211 milligrams per deciliter. 100 milliliters is one deciliter. So that's why it's milligrams per deciliter. And a sigma of 46 milligrams per deciliter. So now the question is, does that sample that we have drawn differ from our overall US population or is it identical? So the null hypothesis is here, is the sample mean here labeled as mu, we would label it M equal to our population mean of 211 milligrams per deciliter. Our alternative hypothesis is the group actually has a different mean. It's not identical. So it's our mean M or mu is unequal to 211. That is, the simplest approach in the two-sided set test. So now for that example, we're basically utilizing two different samples. So we have one sample where the mean is 195 milligrams per deciliter. We have a second sample where it's 227 milligrams per deciliter. So the calculation is depicted on this slide and it's considerably simple, right? So we're calculating a set and we know the formula is M minus mu or X bar minus mu, which is a synonymously used uh, nomenclature. We have the sample mean minus our population mean. That gets us the difference. And that difference is being standardized with the standard error of the mean, which is sigma of the population divided by square root of the N. That's the standard error of the mean. And this gets us a set score. And this sets score, so we have 195 minus 211. That's minus 16 divided by 46 divided by square root of 25. So it's 46 divided by five, that's 9.9.2. So we have 16 divided by 9.2 gets us to minus 1.74. Minus 1.74 on the set score table we can easily look up now. We have here minus 1.74. Oh, oh, four. This is 0 0.049. So please make sure that you know how to read the distribution table so that you know uh, one decimal is, is a row and the second decimal is in the columns. So 0 0.0409 is identical with minus 1.74. So since this was a two-sided test, we need to utilize now uh, the principle of two tails. So we know the P of one side of the negative side is 0 0.0409, so 0 0.041. We need, because it was a two-sided test, we need to multiply this by two gets us to 0 0.082. Since this exceeds our alpha and is actually bigger than the alpha, we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, but accepting the, uh, when, uh, accepting the null hypothesis. If you would do the same exercise with uh, the second sample population where the mean cholesterol was 227, we would uh, calculate now 227 minus 211, that's 16, just like this example, the positive 16, divided by the standard error of the mean, which is 9.2, 46 divided by uh, square root of 25, would again get us to 1.74, so it's plus 1.74. If we go in the distribution table and we look for plus 1.74, Oh. 
if we look for 1.7 plus 1.74, this is 0 0.9591. Since it's symmetrically, we know already that this has to be identical to 0 0.041. And it is, if you calculate it up. So the calculation here will be identical to the other one because it's again, two times 0 0.041 gets us again to 0 0.082. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Happy to hear that. Any questions to that? It's as a concept, it's very important. You're basically you're calculating a set. You're calculating a, calculating a difference between your sample mean, your population mean, and you're standardizing this with the standard error of the mean. The resulting set gets you to the corresponding p-value, which is 0.041. You just got to make sure that you're accounting for both sides. This is that probability, and this is the probability. It's on both sides of the normal distribution curve. The multiplication by two is usually a little bit harder to get a hold on. Yes. Is that like, I know for step three, like that's just always like you plug that in the numbers change. But doing multiple sets of formula, like it's always just going to end up being two times whatever the number is, right? Or a two-sided test, two -sided yes. Test, but you to write it out in all those sets. You can just multiply you, the number on the distribution table by two. Mm, yes, that percentage needs to be, well, if you want to help yourself and remember, then I would write it out. If the question is write it out, then, then I would write it out. So for the homework, for example, it makes sense to write it out. But yeah, it's, it's, it makes it easier. So these notations, I think there's value in being comfortable with the notations and know how to formulate them because this is what you may read in books. So moving forward in your future education, you may come across uh, such nomenclature. Actually, you will most likely come across nomenclature like that. So now, uh, yeah. So if you're having now less than 5%, does this Im Im imply now that the 95% confidence that the null hypothesis is true, that this, this is not the implication? So it still can be true at a probability uh, that is greater than 5%, but it's, it's definitely 95%. Um, so now we're coming to the peculiar case of a one-sided hypothesis. And as I said last time, one-sided hypotheses are a rarity, very hard to get through a statistical review board. It needs an underlying justification why you use a one-sided test because you're not multiplying it by two, thereby you're more likely to reject an null hypothesis and you need a direction. So you need to have a directional uh, hypothesis in a way. And the directional hypothesis is, as, as the prime example, I always come up with the same example, is something that will always change in one direction. And the, the prime example in my head is uh, the, the growth of a child, because children will grow and not shrink. So it only goes in one direction. Thereby, this is a good example, I think. So when you have now as the null hypothesis that your mean will be greater than your population mean, and your alternative hypothesis says that the mean will be smaller than your population mean. You're looking at a one-sided hypothesis. The calculation is absolutely identical, but you're not multiplying it by two. The only thing that's really important is that you know which probability you're actually quantifying. And you're quantifying the probability of this null uh, alternative hypothesis. So you're actually interested in anything that is below your threshold below your quantified p-value. So you are looking from that set of minus 16 divided by 9.2, minus 1.74, everything lower than that. Because that's what you're interested in. That's your research hypothesis. And you're quantifying the probability of this being uh, true. So now if you have a research hypothesis uh, that points in the opposite direction, 
So you have a null hypothesis, your mean is smaller, equal to 211 milligrams per deciliter, whereas your research hypothesis is greater than 211 milligrams per deciliter. Then you essentially are interested in a P above that threshold. So that's basically how you will quantify your P value for one set of hypothesis where you're interested in everything greater than that value. So that's why it's important to, to clearly define your null hypothesis, because once you have your null hypothesis, you will consequently have your research hypothesis. And once you have a research hypothesis, this is just filling something out on a, uh, on a normal distribution sketch and knowing which probability to use. Any questions on that? Okay, we will do an example on the on, on, on lab day next week. So uh, you will there have a possibility to kind of uh, look at this in a little bit more in detail. So that is hypothesis testing. Also known in this context, hypothesizing after the results are known, harking, and the p-hacking where you basically subset until you get a final result and a significant difference. And today we're gonna to talk about the continuation of the thought process. So we are assuming an alpha of 5%. In most cases, it's 5%. Uh, and for that reason, I have uh, included a paper on module 10, which is the work from Hyde, Fenema, and Lamon. La Lamon. It's a research from a meta-analysis that was analyzing and summarizing results that were accumulated, aggregated over the 70s and the 80s, comparing the mathematical performance between boys and girls. Uh, well, some of these, these studies have shown actual differences and have reported differences. And what the meta-analysis showed was that there was actually in the extremes, maybe a difference, which has skewed the mean estimates, as it always does, right? We remember the mean is skewed by outliers. But essentially, and this is what is important to keep in mind, the distribution was not differ different at all. So if you have differences here in the extremes, that doesn't mean much when the bulk of the population, the major part of the population actually is identically and overlapping in terms of the distribution. And this is what uh, Nolan and Heinzen want to show now in this uh, context, because there are some gender differences in term, terms of different tasks. So they report that females were better with competition, whereas males were better with problem solving for whatever reason. Um, but the major part of the population was identically. So there are no differences between the genders in terms of mathematical performance, according to uh, the authors, which kind of gives now a, a lot of background to the so-called new statistics, which basically mean to discourage researchers to only pay attention to point estimates and this hypothesis testing, which basically gives you two point estimates, uh, a p-value, and based on that, you make a distinction between two populations being different. No, it rather encourages researchers to pay attention to A distributions, variabilities, effect sizes that we'll talk about today, confidence intervals, which is basically a reflection of variability, as we'll discuss later, and meta-analysis, which is a, a wonderful and very sophisticated and advanced uh, statistical method to aggregate the results of various studies. Uh, you have the paper of Haidt, Fenneman, and uh, Lehmann uh, on your module. Feel free to read it and uh, learn about these three dimensions. We will discuss effect size and confidence and words and meta-analysis later in this class. But first, let's talk about the confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are basically bringing the point estimate, which is a sample mean, meaning to reflect the population mean, to a new level. It basically means to move away from just having one mean estimate, but quantifying a, uh, an interval estimate. And this basically is a, is a range of plausible values that could be reflecting the population parameter. 
which essentially means you're quantifying with a confidence interval, the confidence you have within a specific interval to have a representation of the population mean. So when we speak about uh, alpha level of 5%, we're essentially looking at a so-called 95% confidence interval because we have the 5% out in the tails and we have the resultant difference on the inside from these critical values. So if we have 2.5% in the tails, everything that is in between these two intervals is 95%. So we are rejecting the null hypothesis and we're assuming that the population parameter, so this is a sample mean estimate. And if it's significantly different, the population mean would be here, outside, or here, outside. If we're defining these two intervals, we're basically defining an interval within which we are 95% confident based on our sample statistic that the population parameter would need to be within these two numbers. If it's not, we can automatically reject the null hypothesis. So confidence intervals can also be utilized for hypothesis testing which is the beauty of a confidence interval. So what we're essentially doing is we're calculating, this is meant to be upper. We're quantifying a lower bound, a lower limit and an upper limit. And we're doing this in the same fashion as we have calculated uh, individual raw scores based on our set scores. We're basically uh, multiplying our minus set and our plus set with the standard error of the mean and adding it to the sample mean. Thereby we get um, two numbers, a lower and an upper bound, which quantifies 95% confidence of capturing that population mean based on the sample statistics. And I want to do this quickly in an example. I've added some examples in this class. And it's module 10, one sample set tests. I want to quickly run through an example here. Okay, let's take this 7.3. So we have the following example. You're conducting a set test on a sample of 132 people for whom you observe the mean verbal score on the SAT, university, university admission test used in the US and other countries of 490. The population mean is 500 and the standard deviation is 100. Calculate the mean and the spread of the comparison distribution, uh, standard error of the mean and the sample, uh, yeah the mu of the sample. Uh, in addition to that, we're also going to do the confidence interval to, to bring this to practice, right? So first of all, always read the question very, very carefully. What is given to you and what do you want to do with this? So firstly, we know that the sample size is 132. So we know the so-called N. I'm trying to get this in. Okay. Okay, so the N is 132. Um, in our sample of 132 people, the SAT score was 490. So that's our X bar. The population mean is 500 and the standard deviation is 100. So our mu is 500. Our sigma is 100. So that's essentially our starting ground. So this is the information that is given by the question. And that's all you need. Because now you can basically calculate the standard error of the mean by calculating sigma divided by square root of your n. 
that gives you an estimate of your sigma, right? And that's simple. What you need next is um, your set. Number six. This is our set. This is the equation for the set. So this is set is M minus the population mean divided by our standard error of the mean. So our set equals M minus the mu divided by our standard error of the mean. So our set here is minus 1.14 or 15. And now what we need to do is uh, we're just looking that up. So it's minus 1.15. We're going on the sets code table, minus 1.15. Oops, minus 1.15. It's right here. It's 0 0.1251. And 0 0.1251. What do we need to do? It's a two-sided test. So the probability to PR of set equals minus 1.15 is over the 0 0.1251. Right? And we need to multiply this by two, two times PR set equals minus 1.15. That's now this multiplied by two. So our P value is 0 0.25. At an alpha of 5%, This is not less than the alpha. Thereby, we're accepting null hypothesis. Simple. So now we're doing now the next step and we're utilizing now our knowledge. So we're doing 95% confidence in the world. Because that's the alpha that everything turns around. So we do lower limit, upper limit. Now we want to define that interval on the right of the mean and on the positive uh, on the, on, the, on the left of the mean. And we're doing this by uh, equal mean, which is uh, our x bar minus. Remember 1.96 gives us 2.5% on each side, right? So we're doing 1.96 multiplied by the standard error of the mean. So 472 is the lower limit of a 95% confidence at all. X bar plus 1.96 multiplied by the standard error of the mean gives us the upper bar. So we have now we have, um, uh, you would present data as mean, 95% CI. You would present this as 490, uh, 490 uh, with 473 to 507. That's your mean estimate. That is your characterized normal distribution of your sample with a 95% confidence in the world. So if your sample gives you this uh, interval and your mu is outside of that interval, you automatically know the hypothesis testing rejected and our hypothesis. You don't even need to do the calculation of the set. You will just do it as a formality. That's why uh, the estimation of the confidence at the world is so such a powerful way. I'm, I will be posting the spreadsheet, but oh. yeah. Or well, you want to take a picture of me? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm posting the spreadsheets, don't worry. Yes, I, also, I, I bring them in a better shape and, and everything. 
so this is really uh, this is really how you do that and the confidence in the world so this is this is a typical quiz example that can come like calculate the confidence in the world for this set of numbers or uh, this is the study that was conducted give me the confidence in the world it's simple it's not terrible the concept is important to be understood that's why i'm, I'm spending a lot of time trying to explain the concepts in in in, in the most tangible ways um, so this is a 95% confidence in the world, but what did we say about the alpha? We also uh, said that the alpha is basically an arbitrarily chosen threshold. So 5% is like, yeah, uh, the statistician Fisher came up in the UK back in the 60s was 5%. Since then, everybody strives to have 5%. But you can also make it in, in genetic testing, you do 10%. So you do a 90% CI. It's the same principle. If you go into the distribution table, if you think about it, I'm now less confident that I will capture the population mean. Will that be a wider interval than 95% confidence interval or a narrower interval? And that's a million dollar question because you're less confident. Exactly, bingo, very good. It's narrower because if you have a 95% confidence in the world, you have 95% probability. If it gets narrower in your set score and, and, and your p-value deriving from the set score, you get less confidence. So you may have a narrow estimate. If you make a 99% confidence in the world, it gets wider because you increase your confidence to capture the population parameter and you since this is probabilities, if you take a wider interval, you just increase your probability to capture that, that mean. That is the principle. Very good, thank you. So, and if we go in the distribution table, we just need to find, we have a two-sided test. We have a two-sided test. We're looking for 10% alpha. You have a question? Yeah. So why is that example two-sided because five percent is just what, what what is being used in the majority of cases. So in like a question on the test, like you would just decide what percent if you want to use. That depends. If it's not given, in case of doubt, you save for the five percent. If it's not given in the question and you choose five percent and it's really not explained in the question, I would give you all points because you chose five percent that I'm telling you here now officially is like 95, 99 percent of all papers use five percent. So hmm? it's standard. Well, you have in uh, in genetic testing, you have a lot of parameters, we have a really small sample size. You would sometimes take a little bit of of more leniency to kind of sense whether there's a signal in the genetic testing you could think of sometimes with small sample sizes and when you really have a hypothesis driven research you would even report p-values and results that are not significant and you will label them as quote-unquote borderline significant because the trend per se may reveal information that is relevant moving forward. I have, for example, we have done a subset analysis of a, of a large NIH study, and we have reported p-values of eight, nine percent. And we said like, look, it's, it's, it's a subset analysis. It's underpowered, but there's something in there because it's consistent signal. So with, with this p-value, you need to step away a little bit to make this like the overarching paradigm sometimes data also reveals something that does not necessarily fulfill the criteria of a significant result. But it, it, it needs to be taken cautiously, obviously. So you need to make, uh, you need to take the precautions to basically clearly and transparently state it was underpowered. That's what we see. It's been consistent. We replicated analyses, but the p-value did not reach significance. But hypothetically, it may be something insightful and should be considered for future studies. Something along these lines. In case of doubt, yes. In case of doubt. If it's stated and you take 5%, that, that would not be okay. If 90%, if yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, so, but in case you want to choose a different confidence interval, you would basically need to find, okay, so we have 10% alpha, that's 5% each side, right? So the only thing you need to do, you find 5% here, and that's 1.65. 1.65 gives you 5% on each side. So now uh, multiply this by two. So 1.65, are we going to bring this into Excel? We're just doing the same story. We're doing uh, equals mean X bar minus 1.65 multiplied by standard error of the mean. And it's just like uh, you correctly said, it's narrow. If we do an upper limit, we do X bar plus uh, 1.65 multiplied by standard error of the mean, 504. So it's error. If we do a 99% CI, we're doing the same story. We're looking, now we're looking for a really small parameter. We're looking for 0 0.05. And that's somewhere here. So 2.58 is usually accepted as being uh, the set score corresponding was 99% confidence in the world. So we're doing the same story. We're doing mean X bar minus 2.58 multiplied by our standard error of the mean. Gets us a wider range. X bar plus 2.58 multiplied by standard error of the mean, 512. Hmm. And this is basically uh, how you do confidence in the world. And you, you define the confidence you're striving for, and you define the set score. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Confidence in the world. Okay. So this is the confidence interval, and this is, it's simple to calculate, but it's a very powerful parameter, and it's a very powerful way of reporting data, because you have, it was in these three components, in the brackets, you state the 95% confidence interval. You don't even have to report your set score, your p-value, you don't need that anymore. You can just report this variability, and you can say, okay, so based on the confidence interval, it's obvious, it's significantly different. So it's like two birds with one stone. Okay, so that's the confidence interval. And now we're getting a little deep into something different. So when you calculate a set, you calculate it as mean minus population mean divided by the standard error of the mean. And you're standardizing your normal distribution, your distribution of the sample means on the difference from the mean. So the problem is, if you have a very large sample, or you want to compare the effect of an intervention that you have employed on, on your sample in different studies, you want to compare this independent of sample size. Because your standard error of the mean, arithmetically, a sigma divided by square root of the n, needs to be dependent on the sample size. So it's strongly dependent on the sample size. So this being said, if you have different effect sizes and differences, this will, if the variability and the sample size is the same and the differences are different, then it will show even if you do your set scores. But if you have a situation where you have the same differences and you have different sample sizes and the, the, the estimate of your standard error of the mean gives you a narrower estimate, this will essentially uh, give you a significant result, although the difference didn't change. And therefore, you want something that is comparable independent of sample size, and this is labeled Cohen's D, or effect size. And the effect size really takes away the emphasis on the sample size, but puts the emphasis on the differences between the sample mean and the population mean, or between the sample means, if you do if you compare samples. So for the, for the calculation of Cohen's D, you basically calculate M, so your sample mean, minus the population mean, and you divide it by the standard deviation, the sigma of the population. 
Consequently, you get, you get the so-called effect size. And this effect size will take on uh, values between, yeah, you kind of, you get the pictures, like the estimation is not gonna be that much different. It's gonna be smaller than the set, but it's still gonna be somewhere in the ballpark of the set. And you basically, you get 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 gives you a small effect size. 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 gives you a medium effect size and greater than 0 0.8 gives you a large effect size. And each of these conventions, each of these gradings quantifies the amount of overlap between your two samples. So if you have a sample like this, you have 85, 67, 53. So you have 85% overlap gives a small effect size and a small one would be 53% over, although this is even less than that. So the overlap determines the effect size. The smaller the, effect, the, smaller the overlap, the, the larger the effect size. But the shape doesn't change, right? Keep in mind, the normal distribution, the shape doesn't change. What changes is the overlap, and the more overlap, the less likely it is significant. So that's Cohen's D. Yeah. L look at these values, right? So the less overlap, the larger the effect size. Because keep in mind, keep in mind this depiction where you have equal differences between both analyses. But what's different is the variability that creates less overlap, this region. The overlapping region is working against you and against your probability of finding significant difference. The more overlap, the less significant. Effect size, effect size, and yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, don't worry, don't worry. Don't. <laughs> it's a little bit. It, it's thinking. So, so, so the whole the whole hypothesis testing. You need to think around one corner. And it's 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 not a conventional way of thinking about things if if you haven't been exposed to statistics. Okay. If you have effect sizes, the advantage of effect sizes it takes the the weight from away from the sample size. Therefore, it has a beautiful advantage, which is it makes studies comparable. It makes them comparable to each other, irrespective of sample size, and it puts the weight on the differences. So thereby you can also utilize them to compare studies directly. And one way to do that is by basically analyzing them in what is called a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is basically the highest, the highest scientific evidence. So you basically, you go from, uh, and then right, let's talk about this later. So basically it helps to amalgamate results from several studies into one analysis. So I, I forget what that actually, what the effect size was quantifying here, but basically you have the effect size from different studies. You have point estimates and interval estimates, and you can amalgamate them in one analysis and you get across all these studies, one overarching aggregated estimate of the effect size across all studies. And usually the really sophisticated models, they take even the variability, they take the sample sizes, they take all kinds of stuff into account. Uh, I did now one was a linear mixed effects model, which was actually very, very, very fancy method to use. So I didn't do it. Statistician made it. Um, it was a very, very fascinating piece of work. So you basically have like this overarching estimate across all studies and with effect sizes, you basically took out the effect of sample size. And this is considered the highest scientific evidence, meaning meta-analysis really up there, solves all the debates and controversies about, uh, across certain topics. And then you go and the next level, you have a so-called randomized controlled trial, where you basically you have, and we've talked about experimental designs, where you basically you randomize uh, subjects into either group and thereby you minimize and hopefully eliminate the risk of confounding. By randomization, you basically have an, 
You have what in trial design is called equipoise. You have exchangeability and uh, an equal distribution of confounding variables into those two groups. So they, they are identically, quote unquote, identically, as identically as they can be by randomization. If you have, uh, at the next level, you have a so-called cohort study. That's an observational study where you basically uh, have subjects assigned to either arm of your, of your multi-sample study. And you assign them for, for example, if you, uh, if you want to study the effect of smoking on lung cancer, you're going to use an observational design, right? Because you, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to get through an ethic commission that you're going to have your people start smoking because you want to study them. So it's, it's, it's kind of on ethical grounds, you need to use observational designs, right? So this is a cohort study. So that's the third level of scientific evidence. The next level of evidence is uh, a case control study. Case control study would be, for example, okay, so I have now, okay, let's stick with smoking example because that's an interesting one. Because so I, uh, I work at a cancer clinic and I pick patients that were diagnosed with lung cancer and I pick them and I looked what proportion of these lung cancer patients were smokers. And then I use another sample uh, of, of, of people that uh, serve as a control and I quantify how many were smokers and how many did have lung cancer. So this is a case control study. You create your own control based on the cases that you have at your disposition. And the last one is basically where I say like, okay, so I have a cross-sectional design where I have, uh, I have XYZ the, the XYZ proportion of lung cancer patients and that many smokers. And then I try to find associations within a cross-sectional study. So that's the lowest level of evidence. So, but meta-analysis is definitely the highest one and it amalgamates in many cases data from randomized studies. That's also important to keep in mind. And so now the problem you have with a meta-analysis is negative findings. Only studies that report positive significance findings will get published. The other ones end up in the file drawer. And those that end up in the file drawer are negative studies. They have not been published because they did not show significant results. Hypothetically, not always the case, but hypothetically, in many cases, that would be the case. All the negative findings get reported. There's even a journal specialized in negative findings nowadays, which is actually a wonderful, wonderful innovation because they need to be understood by the population, uh, by, the, by the community as well. But the file draw analysis basically is a quantification of. So you have a meta analysis that shows a significant result, shows a significant effect of. Um, I don't know exercise on on happiness. And you have 10 different studies that showed that exercising really makes a difference. People are happier once they exercise. Now, this effect has certain strengths. So this effect has, has a certain value. And now the estimate is, the estimate of a file draw analysis is like how many negative studies would have needed to end up in a file drawer for my results to become non-significant. So that's, that's the angle uh, with which uh, a file draw analysis looks at research results and at a meta-analysis. So you can various, you can also do replication or reproducibility. You can do subsets in meta-analysis. You can do various aspects. Um, depends on the number of studies you have. Just to give you an idea, so there's also an overview how to do a meta-analysis. So I mentioned the meta-analysis that I was involved in. I worked with a team of eight people. Uh, I supervised this uh, endeavor. We screened five and a half thousand papers and we ended up with 19 papers in a meta-analysis. It took us two years. I submitted it last week. So <laughs> that they, well, they first need to accept it, but I'm just giving you an idea why this is so important to do. If you are interested, and, and 
I, I sent some interest here. If you really are interested in meta analysis, one really cool website, let me show you that. We have a good time. Um, it's the so-called Cochrane. So you have in the Cochrane database, and this is publicly accessible, you have in the Cochrane library, and this is a group originated from the UK, they're worldwide. Whatever you're interested in, whatever topic you're interested in, you search it. And it will give you a meta-analysis with whatever medical, psychometric, psychological intervention ever studied on planet Earth is like they cover a very wide field. They give you risk of bias assessments of whatever uh, intervention you're interested in. They give you an amalgamation, they give you reports. Working with the Cochrane is very prestigious. It's, um, it's just absolutely fabulous what they're producing. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a great site. So those of you that are interested in, in scientific insights and scientific progress, like this, you really want to give it a look. They have their own COVID section, they have their own section for vaccination effectiveness, etc. etc. So it's you really spoiled with a lot of choice and insights. You're welcome. You're welcome. Enjoy. Well, since we're at it already, uh, so did I show you clinicaltrials.gov? Like another one, yeah, clinicaltrials.gov will give you an overview of currently conducted or currently registered studies. That's where you find all the studies. Every large trial, they all have a registration there on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, if you're interested in data, the NIH has the data repository. If you're interested in data of the US population, okay, okay, now I'm getting carried away. Uh, so, if you're interested in studying the US population, you have the so-called uh, nutrition health and nutri nutrition examination survey. It's the largest study of its kind, quantifying data since the 1990s in the US population. Analytically a little bit challenging, but great for master thesis. I'm, I'm working right now with a field work, uh, with a student on her master uh, essay up in CUNY. Uh, they have variables, you find everything. You have surveys, you have quality of life, you have assessments, you have x-rays, you have bioimpedance data, you have DEXA data, you have everything. You have lab parameters, all lab parameters you could think of. It's funded by the CDC, it's the largest study in the world. There are some subsets, there's a, there's a New York City Haynes, uh, there's a large one is in China, one is in Taiwan, uh, and the Europeans do some in some countries. So this is publicly accessible data. You literally can find the variable, you can download it directly on your computer. It's free of charge. So keep that in mind when you do projects, when you when you brand for master thesis, like you have everything in there. Okay, meta analysis. So we have uh, meta analysis, file draw analysis. We have statistical power. Um, okay, five minutes. We talked about the type one error and the type two error. Type one error is rejecting something that you shouldn't have rejected. Type two error is not rejecting what you should have rejected. Why would that be the case? Because you may not have studied enough individuals. I talked before about subset analysis where suddenly the p-value is not significant anymore, but it points somewhat in the direction. That is in some shape or form, that's a type two error because if the sample size would have been larger, we would have seen a significant result. So statistical power as per definition is the probability that we will reject the null hypothesis when we should reject it. To put this in other words, if we are looking at this table, if the null hypothesis is true and you accept the null hypothesis, you're making the right decision. If the research hypothesis is true, and you're rejecting the null hypothesis, you're making the right decision, right? 
if the null hypothesis is true, but you're rejecting the null hypothesis, you're making the wrong decision. That's when you do a type one error. You're rejecting something you shouldn't have rejected. If you have a research hypothesis that is true and the null hypothesis is not true, and you're accepting the null hypothesis and say there's no difference, you're committing a type two error. So now when you have, when you think of the probability of this being either, when you th think just of this column, the probability of these two decisions is 100%, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was tracking you on this. <laughs> okay, now, now let's, think, let's think about it. Let's think. No, 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 but I, I want you to come along with me. Think about it because you have, you. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't worry. So you have you have you have a finding that is indeed true. The research hypothesis is, is true. No matter what you think about it, no matter what how you look at it, it will always be true. It's it's the irrefutable truth. Good. So now the probability for uh, this to be diagnosed as either right or wrong needs to add up to 100 percent, right? So it's either right. In the, as per my assessment, or is wrong as per my assessment, and it's either correct or not correct. So this adds up to 100%. So if I have a type 2 error, that is me making a wrong decision based on the grounds that I'm accepting the null hypothesis, although I should have rejected it. The difference of 100 minus the type 2 error, this right decision. That is my statistical power. That is the difference between a type two error, which should be less than 10% and 100% of either right or wrong. Yeah, this is a really good visual. So kind of really memorize this visual. Yes, please. What about the statistical power in terms of like the top left? Like if there's probability that there's no type one error. Does that exist or just the probability if they're not going to take two errors? That is a very good question. Could you have an idea if we say, okay, so the null hypothesis is true and we're adding this up to a probability of 100% and we're thinking of a wrong decision, which is the type one error. If we do 100 minus the type one error, which is mostly 5%. Could you think of something we have discussed in, in exactly. This is your confidence. Yeah. And this is this is why I think this table is so super amazing because it you 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 see it right in front of you. That's that's where the money is. It's like so there are a couple of tables, and I will flag those tables, which are for the understanding just that's that's really the core piece of understanding this topic. That's one of them. Okay, statistical power. You can calculate this by basically incorporating uh, a mean of the population, a population standard deviation, a sample mean, a sample size, a standard error based on the sample size, Definition of a critical set value. I'm not going to show you the formula because the formula is, is quite an intense formula. Um, but basically, you you take all this into account. You take all these dimensions into account, and based on that, you basically uh, either you calculate the power, or and this is what the standard error here explicitly says based on the sample size or you estimate the sample size. So if you have a desired power of 90%, you know this. And the only thing that you need to estimate based on your formula and all these dimensions is this. So you use this for sample size estimation. 
So you basically, uh, let's say you're applying for um, $10 million from the NIH because you want to conduct that study. Great idea, super idea, studied in some smaller samples. You have an idea about the population and you have an idea about the standard division. You have an idea what the sample means are going to be, what the effective, the efficacy of your intervention will be. So you have sample means, sample size, standard error, more the standard deviation estimated based on previous literature research and previously published reports. You estimate that standard deviation and based on that, you will then, you know the critical set value, which is which is 1.96. You know the power that you want is 90%. And you will utilize the power calculation to estimate the sample size that you will need to study for your study in order to achieve that power that you want to achieve, that you're promising the NIH and that you put in your budget that you propose to the NIH. So this is why power calculation and sample size estimation, this is why this is important. Okay, I, I guess we're at the end. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Uh, I do not play with SPSS. I had to teach this like last sem last sem no, last year. No, in four semesters. I, I taught a class in SPSS and I, I